thanks first uh, to Maurice Jackson and Sue Kozal, who asked me to write an essay uh, for a book they were doing on abolitionists um, here and abroad, and it gave me a chance to go back to this man, Warner Mifflin, who no one has heard of, that um, I had become interested in a good while ago. And so this was a chance to see what I could find. And I was looking for scraps of evidence and I ended up with basketfuls. And out of that essay um, came a book. And also thanks to Dan Richter and David Waldstriker who advised Bob Lockhart, the history editor at Penn Press, um, who was interested in the book proposal but needed some assurance from uh, Richter and Wallstriker at the McNeil Center at the University of Pennsylvania that he wasn't going to put Penn Press's reputation at risk by offering a contract. <clears throat> and then thanks to Dan Richter and Wallstriker and a host of others including Mike McDowell, Emma Lapsansky, <clears throat> uh, Mike Zuckerman, Gene Soderlund and Marcus Redeker um, for critical readings of, if I remember right, about draft four or it could have been draft five, who knows. And I must say, uh, if you're interested in Quaker abolitionism, Marcus Redeker has a marvelous new book out on Benjamin Lay, the dwarf, the radical dwarf who he says really um, owes a, a great debt um, from historians who have largely ignored him. Well, now my goal in this book was to restore to memory a man who's known to hardly anyone. Um, Alison Anderson, who's been a Quaker for most of her life and was a, one of the editors at, or, or the senior editor at Penn Press, um, goes to the meeting house regularly and she never heard of the man. Um, and uh, how many in this room have heard of Warner Mifflin. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Well, I don't count you, Emma, because you, we've... <laughs> okay, so pretty much the forgotten man. Um, that wasn't so at all in the era of Washington, Hamilton, Adams, Benjamin Franklin. They all knew him. They all knew him well. Um, he corresponded with them. He knocked on their doors. He conversed with them. Um, uh, there was hardly anyone in the streets of Philadelphia after the American Revolution who wouldn't have recognized Warner Mifflin, partly because he was just under seven feet tall, but even more because he was one of the most intense, earnest uh, people they uh, had ever met. And he was well known in Europe after the Revolution. Crev Kerr, the author of Letters to the American Farmer, knew him, wrote about him, uh, so did <clears throat> Jean-Pierre Brissot de Warville, um, and so did Clarkson. <clears throat> Thomas Clarkson, who in 1808 wrote this epic history of the abolition of the American slave trade. And in the beginning of the book, folding out in two pages, was this Riverine, if you might call it that, map of abolitionism, where starting at the top and to the right are the Americans, and on the other side to the left are the English, or the Atlantic Ocean in between. And each little rivulet turning into a stream has the name of an early abolitionist. They're arranged chronologically from top to bottom. And we get back down to where the two sides of the Atlantic connect just below the arrow, which points to Warner Mifflin. Uh, and now the transatlantic abolitionist movement um, became conjoined. <clears throat> so this was someone in 1808, uh, after Mifflin's death, that uh, Clarkson knew. So some of these people who communed with Mifflin liked what they saw and what he did. But many others, including some of the founding fathers, uh, had a different view of them. <clears throat> they regard him as a man who tended everyone's business but his own. 
Um, he was called a meddling fanatic, uh, a man who was bent on disunifying the only recently unified nation uh, after the American Revolution. He was known in the South, as I will tell you more about in a minute, uh, as a very, very dangerous Quaker. A pacifist, yes, but what he was trying to do, uh, in their point of view, Southern slave owners in the main, uh, was something quite different. And in gathering the wrath of Southerners, he all but stitched a target on the back of his simple undyed clothes that he wore. And yet, he inspired many in this early period of abolitionism um, because he spent a good part of his life trying to convince people that this country would never be unified and it could never live up to the principles on which it was founded until they dealt with the problem of slavery. <clears throat> and Mifflin then was the key figure linking the first and second wave of abolitionists. The first wave, John Woolman, Benjamin Lay, and a few before that, they were the lonely voices in the wilderness of, from the 1688 Germantown protests forward through the 1750s, 60s, and 70s. Woolman had died in 1772 in England. Benize, Anthony Benize had died. Is that, oh my goodness, that's me? Uh, <laughs> And my wife told me, you just have to turn the darn thing off. With... Oh, I'm such a klutz. <laughs> so we had this early cadre of abolitionists, uh, very few uh, struggling mightily to make themselves heard. And then after the revolution in the early 19th century, a second wave of abolitionists. Um, and it was, Mifflin, above all, who created a bridge between this first and second a group of abolitionists. <clears throat> he grew up in Kent County, Kent County, Delaware. Um, these, are, these are some of those who became his friends in Philadelphia but were much shyer than him. John and James Pemberton, uh, John Drinker, um, um, Henry Drinker, um, and John Parrish. <clears throat> and here is where Mifflin grew up. Um, not showing so well here, but um, I do have a pointer. Let me see if I can master this. Um, in Kent County, just south of Dover, here, where his plantation was called Chestnut Grove. His, his great-grandfather was a Mifflin from Philadelphia uh, who in 1712 gave up what could have been a very promising life as a son of an already established merchant to go all the way to the tip of, of the eastern shore and married there a woman uh, who, uh, and, and then gradually his grandfather um, moved north and his father um, up to uh, a plantation here where he grew up called Farzalia. So that gives you a sense of where he was. But he was close enough to Philadelphia so that he was a fil familiar figure on the streets here and a regular at all the um, yearly meetings um, and other, other meetings there. One would never have guessed, he never would have guessed, on the eve of the American Revolution that he would devote his life to anti-slavery. In fact, where he grew up um, <clears throat> in Virginia, um, his father owned about 100 slaves, was, was the largest slave owner um, of Accomack County. And he grew up, uh, slaves around him, uh, they outnumbered the Mifflin family 10 to 1 in those days. And then he married in 17, um, 67 to a woman who brought additional slaves to the marriage. And he was living the life of a Kent County Justice of the Peace, a large landowner, a large slave owner, um, and a man living in some, um, some small luxury. 
um, until in 1774 and 1775, he had out-of-body visitations. Uh, one occasion by severe sicknesses, he thought he was going to lose his life and that a god angry with him as a slave owner um, would make the end of him. And then shortly after that, a tremendous lightning and thunderstorm. This kind of out-of-mind experience is, is, is very much part of the conversion experience. Uh, these moments of, of enlightenment, these epiphanies. And that's what happens um, to Mifflin. <clears throat> now, one thing I try to do in this book, after explaining how this conversion occurred in 1774 and 75, when he released all of the slaves that he had inherited from his family and brought by his wife as dowry slaves, um, into their early marriage. <clears throat> After that freeing of the slaves, uh, he became what I call, I hope I'm right about this, the father of American reparations. I mean, the idea of reparationism is very familiar to us uh, in, in our own day. Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition of a couple of decades ago uh, put the idea of reparations for those who'd been enslaved um, over the years was something that uh, they were entitled to and that America uh, owed them. But it was Mifflin, uh, he wasn't the first to mention the word. They called it restitution, not reparations, but very synonymous. He wasn't the first to mention it, but his first is, uh, 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 or very much among the first to actually do something about it. And that's when he freed his slaves in 1774 and 75. He gave them land. He gave them back wages, uh, even one uh, for every year that they labored for him after reaching adulthood. That would be 18 for males, 21 for women. Or uh, he leased them land on a kind of sharecropping, but rather generous sharecropping arrangement. <clears throat> so he really was, I think, um, the first to propose to Quakers um, that they owed it to those who had been enslaved to not send them out into the world, going back to the Old Testament, to biblical injunctions, not send them out into the world with nothing. What was it to be free in Kent County, Delaware? Uh, if you had not an education, you had no land, what would freedom be without the means to make something of it? And he meant to do something about it for him. Now, a word on Mifflin um, as he becomes a, lob a lobbyist after the Revolution, <clears throat> starting when he visited the Continental Congress in Princeton in 1783. Why was the Congress in Princeton? Because they fled Philadelphia when the Pennsylvania Line mutinied to get their back wages, unpaid for several years. They took refuge in Princeton, and that's where Mifflin and Benizé and a delegation of Quakers petition in hand uh, went to Nassau Hall and laid before the Continental Congress a memorial asking for the end of slavery, uh, the gradual abolition of slavery, and the end of the slave trade. <clears throat> so this immediately differentiates him from John Woolman and Anthony Benizé. Um, he becomes the premier legislative lobbyist of his generation. And it's Mifflin who introduces methods of lobbying uh, to reach those with power uh, that are a foreshadowing of modern uh, uh, um, political lobbying. <clears throat> Woolman wrote um, his moving journal and he made these foot journeys, as they called them, through the South to visit slave owners house by house, one by one, to try to convince them to give up his slaves. Benazé, school teacher in Philadelphia of poor white and black children, um, and perhaps the most eminent essayist of this early abolition movement, uh, both have an honorable role in the annals of abolitionism. But they were quiet in what they did, um, and they did not do what Mifflin did. He went to the centers of power at the state and federal level, the legislatures 
of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and camp out there, uh, button-holding legislators, sitting on the doorsteps of the legislative chambers if he wasn't allowed in and waiting for them to come out at the end of the day uh, and then try to talk to them. Go to their lodgings, knock on their door. He did this um, <clears throat> for years, basing his argument that an all-seeing and affronted God would push, would punish Americans for what he called national sins, holding of slaves and the trading in slaves. Over and over again, he said the republic would not survive the betrayal of its natural rights founding principles. He was welcome to keep his own conscience, his opponents said, and they needed none of his help to, none of his help uh, <clears throat> to keep theirs. So this was a man who, from 1775, um, developed a way of life where a moral compass of his own um, kept him on the road month after month, year after year. So that moral compass at first directed him to work within the Society of Friends. In 1781, for example, <clears throat> the war is still on. Um, he and his close friend George Churchman of Chester County started off on what ended up as a months long 1400 mile on horse journey um, through Philadelphia and all the way north as far as Nantucket Island, Mass Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Here with the war not yet over, they were trying to stiffen the spine of local Quaker communities um, who were straying from the pacifism which had been the hallmark of the Society of Friends. We're selling to one army or the other, British or American, or dealing in continental currency, which strict Quakers like Mifflin regarded as blood money. Uh, supporting the war, and therefore blood money. So this is just a map, of, we, we can't have uh, time to look at it in detail, but through countless villages and towns uh, all, the, all along the way for these many months, they kept preaching the strict doctrine of Quaker pacifism and anti-slavery as well. <clears throat> and then the needle of his compass pointed in a different direction instead of inward toward the society friends, uh, outward where he saw his crusade as one to save the soul of America. <clears throat> For Warner, this was a holy war, a war with words, not weapons. The idea frightened some who shared his belief that the new United States would drown in its own blood and corrupt the principles that they boasted <clears throat> in a new epoch of enlightened humanity, but who thought he was moving too fast. And some of his Philadelphia friends, too, thought he was moving too fast. They tried to put a brake on it. <clears throat> and sometimes he did bow in submission to Quakers such as the Pembertons and Henry Drinker, his Philadelphia friends, who tried to temper his intensity and curb his impatience. <clears throat> but he never surrendered the belief that he could change the arc of history. It's also true that Mifflin became broodingly devout, poring over his Bible, littering his letters, and his appeals to legislative bodies with scripture. He never claimed a special channel of communication with God, the posture of a prophet, and he didn't feel that he was in possession of revealed truth, that he was touched on the shoulder to enlighten the unenlightened. Rather, he abased himself before the omnipresent God and hoped he was worthy for
for a place in the celestial heaven. The twin sources for him were the Bible and the old histories, they called them the, of ancient friends. Ancient not so much, only tracing back to the 1650s, 60s, 70s in England. <clears throat> But he worshipped Christ, the Redeemer, and the moral pivot of his outlook on boisterous post-revolutionary America was really no more complicated than the golden rule for friends, a core guiding principle. He invoked it, whatsoever he would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them from Matthew and other parts of the Bible. He used that over and over again with varied words. This kind of intense religious and moral commitment brought him up against a dilemma that he never fully acknowledged. His, absor his absor absorption with God's plan convinced him that without divine intervention, Nothing really was very possible. Yet he spent his adult life acting on the belief that nothing would change without human will put into play. So the helpless individual in providential history, where God's hand rules everywhere, <coughs> had to be reconciled with a man of action who had who believed he could make a difference. There was a reconciliation that he never really resolved. He was tenacious, he was hyper earnest, he was single minded, he was made of stronger stuff than most of his contemporaries. And this came at a cost. More than once he frightened himself, falling into periods of self doubt and fits of remorse. At pushing too far. Rufus Jones, great Quaker historian of the early 20th century, called this agony of the spirit. And I think that describes Warner Mifflin. Thoughts sometimes that he was not doing enough to root out slavery, but also that he must carry on. Um, it led to what Quakers call bodily indispositions. It covers everything from a bad cold to cancer. And he suffered a great deal. From his mid-twenties to the end of his life, <clears throat> sickness plagued him. Another side of Warner Mifflin was a man who matched his pronouncement on slavery with a sweet reasonableness in his dealing with fellow friends and with non-friends. After his death, remembrances in the newspapers spoke of his, quote, amiable character, his affable disposition, his, these are quotes, open, sociable behavior towards all, his qualifications as a peacemaker, his <clears throat> even in his most fervent lobbying efforts with combative southerners, he insisted that he loved them, that they were his brothers, whatever their faults. And through all of it, Mifflin insisted that he was a lover of his country, that he was a patriot. He was a well-wisher to all fellow Americans, a brother at heart, even to those who excoriated him, a servant of the Christian God, a friend of all humankind. He was compassionate, he was forgiving, he was self-deprecating, <coughs> and he was utterly impossible to intimidate. That he could not early restrain himself in his anti-slavery campaign um, 
it has to be admitted, also exacted a considerable toll on his family. He was too much away from his first wife, who died early before she was 40, and his second wife, between them they bore 12 children by him. And death hovered over Chestnut Grove from the beginning to end. Of the 12 children, six never survived infancy. Two of the remaining six, both daughters, died at 22 and 25. There was all of this sadness, and Warner had constantly in motion left behind overtaxed spouses to manage his plantation properties in mid Delaware. <clears throat> Now let's turn for a minute to this business of fanaticism. Fanatic was a favorite term, hurled at him by his southern contemporaries, and the word can be found in some of the work of modern historians, who treat Quakers harshly for daring to raise the issue of abolition after ratification of the Constitution. But who is a fanatic? And what is fanaticism? Well, I think much hinges on who deploys the word uh, and in what context. The word fanatic, to be sure, was familiar to Quakers from the moment of their founding in the midst of the English Civil War of the 1640s and 50s. When the followers of Quaker founders George Fox and Elizabeth Fell broke up Anglican church services or inspired young women to go naked in the streets as a sign of the nakedness of supposed Christians, or motivated followers to ride through the village backward on an ass, or refuse to report for militia duty and make war, or denounced authorities in public places and insisted on the spiritual equality of women, for these people, yes, in long ago, Civil War, England, the charge of fanaticism clung to their clothes like mud, and they paid for it dearly. One of the reasons that Penn and the Quakers came to Philadelphia and New Jersey to escape. Massachusetts Puritans, most of you know in the 1650s, were sure that the Quakers were, were what Cotton Mather called the choke weed of Christianity, the threatened religious uniformity on the Puritan city of the hill. And they paid the price for the hung on the Boston Common. So who was fanatic? The Puritans or the Quakers in 1652? Stephen Crane, famous for his red badge of courage, was sure in 1848 that it was the Puritans who were the fanatics and the Quakers the toleration. Well, coming to America, the Quakers did not actually suffer such charges of fanaticism when they flocked to the shores of the Delaware to build the colonies of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Even their peace testimony <clears throat> during the Seven Years' War and then during the colonial struggles for independence, did the word fanatic uh, get hurled at them. Even Thomas Paine's sledgehammer attack on the Quakers in common sense in 1776 never charged friends with fanaticism, only with what Paine called inconsistency or for mingling religion with politics and for what Paine saw as their misplaced logic. But pinning the badge of fanaticism on Quakers came only after the victorious fight for independence. And it came only from a handful of South Carolina and Georgia congressmen representing what was becoming the slave-owning republic. Post-war Quaker emancipationists particularly Mifflin, who hovered over the conscience of the nation with calls for ending the slave trade and gradually abolishing slavery, 
became the fanatics of America, even if ending slavery had emerged as a key element of the revolutionary reform agenda. To call someone a fanatic is to alert the reader that this person's ideas or behavior are not to be considered seriously except as they pose a mortal threat to the community or the nation. But if we turn our angle of repose, as did historian Robert McCauley half a century ago, we can appreciate that people like Warner Mifflin, in McCauley's words, had faith in the power of moral energy to create beneficial change. While the statesmen, supposedly some of the most liberal in American history, held to a gloomy set of immutable principles which man, it appeared, could have no power to alter." End quote. Mifflin's critics charged that his work for ending the slave trade and beginning the gradual abolition of slavery would fracture, if not dissolve, the new nation. But was he wrong in contending that the nation could never be other than fractured and fragile while slavery continued? Or was Mifflin right in regarding those defending slavery as the fanatics who defile the bedrock principles of natural rights and universal freedom on which the nation was founded, on which the Bible pronounced that all humans sprang from out of seed? <clears throat> so how do we take the measure of such a man who never called for immediate abolition but only for gradual emancipation? In the main, historians have agreed with a small number of hardcore Southerners, not with Quakers like Mifflin, that slavery, the history books tell us, could not have been abolished by the revolutionary generation. That is an argument to me that reeks of the odious concept of historical inevitability. Almost always in historical writing, an explanatory subterfuge to excuse mistakes, and virtually never by those writing on behalf of the victims of a supposedly inevitable decision. <clears throat> Whether we judge Mifflin, Mifflin's crusade is fanatical or alternatively as a calculated, strenuously uphill battle against severe odds. It is clear that his struggle on behalf of black Americans was all but encoded in his genes. I don't know whether you can read this, but this is a runaway slave advertisement that appeared in the Eastern Shore newspapers, uh, where after describing a group of runaway slaves at the bottom, they talk about how they're headed for Warner Mifflin's house. <laughs> and there they can find refuge. What they're describing here is the germ of the Underground Railroad, nearly a half century before it was formed. And this was true. They fled to him, and he poured this out in great detail to his friend Henry Drinker and John, friends Henry Drinker and John Parrish. Uh, in Philadelphia. He would describe coming back from one of his legislative lobbying efforts. There would be people waiting in his door, hoping he would help them. <clears throat> now, let me try to entice you in the last part of my comments with a passage recounting moral, Mifflin's moral intensity um, and his religious commitment to carry the cross as he was fond of saying. So I take you back to September 1798 in the city. <clears throat> Mifflin made, I'm reading a bit from to the last chapter of the book, Mifflin made the fateful decision once more to attend his beloved Philadelphia yearly meeting, always held in late September of the year. 
From a distance of more than two centuries, one is tempted to consider this tantamount to a death wish. Why? Like everyone else, up and down the seaboard, he knew that Philadelphia was once again in the grip of a ferocious yellow fever epidemic. Even as it was recovering from the 1797 yellow fever epidemic, which had followed hard in the 1793 yellow fever epidemic. By September 1798, Congress had decamped in mid-July, and the latest scourge broke out. President John Adams had retreated to Quincy, Massachusetts, and by early August, more than three quarters of Philadelphia's population had entered the city. Yet Mifflin, and his wife and a few other delegates to the early meeting, he was a delegate from Kent County, persisted in convening in what, in what had become a charnel house. By September's end, more than six weeks had passed since most Philadelphians had fed, fled with the papers we call it this malignant scourge. The fever had spread to the city jail, the Pennsylvania hospital where most of the poor contracting the disease had been taken. When he arrived on September 23rd with his wife, Anne Emily Mifflin, he found handbills posted up all over the city in bold capitals. Reflect before it is too late why you prefer famine, sickness, and death to health and plenty. Go before it is too late. Large capital, plot figures. The handbills warned that the fever was selling 100 residents each day, sending half of them to their graves. No matter. Mifflin and a handful of his fellow Quakers were determined to meet. From across the Delaware River in New Jersey, diarist John Hunt scribbled that, quote, the sickness in town was so great and the town so desolate that diarist friends thought it was impracticable a yearly meeting could be held, unquote. Only one representative from the Philadelphia Quarterly Meeting, representing a large territory around Philadelphia, only one was willing to enter the city. From John Hunt's monthly meeting across the river, only two dared go, one paying the ultimate price. The redoubtable Rebecca Jones, the traveling minister who had braved many dangers during years of itinerant missions, took refuge with friends at a safe distance from the city. A few days before departing to come to Philadelphia, Mifflin took up his pen and wrote his will. It all but predicted his death. The opening words, it feels awful to undertake this journey, but believing it is my duty to proceed there, having nothing in view, but to be found in the discharge thereof of him who gave me a being and whom I have faith to believe can preserve me even amidst the raging pestilence if he is so pleased to do however I desire to be resigned to his holy will." Unquote. And then he scratched out the beginnings of how to dispose of his property. <coughs> Arriving in the city, Warner and Dan huddled with the few who chose to defy the grizzly ox against them. Among them was his old friend George Churchman, with whom he had traveled northward to New England <clears throat> for 1,400 miles, 17 years before. Also present was James and Emily, Anne's younger brother, who had come from Chester County as a delegate from his monthly meeting. <clears throat> And also there was his old friend Jacob Lindley, another Chester County, public friend, who reported that those assembled, quote, was about as large as a monthly meeting, unquote, which would be about 60 to 80 people, when usually the early meeting would attract 1, 1,200, even 1,500. <clears throat> Most of those who came, having survived the 1797 epidemic, apparently believed they would endure. And convinced that a watchful God was testing them. 
but they stayed only for two sessions, on September 23rd and 24th. When by consent, by consent they adjourned to reconvene in mid-December, when the winter cold would wash away the epidemic. Where the other delegates headed home, Warner and Anne chose to stay. The ten stricken friends still in the city. Day by day, the death toll mounted. Benjamin Franklin Beish, Franklin's grandson, was dead. Samuel Pastorius, Germantown master builder and grandson of the German immigrant who had led the first protest against slavery in 1688, 110 years before, was followed to the grave by his wife. Also lowered into the ground was Hannah Lindley, the wife of Mifflin's valued friend Jacob Lindley. There were scores more. Of the 21 elders who attended, seven perished. On September 24th, the friends disbanded, Warner sat in his lodging, took pen in hand, and composed the last letter of his life. It was to John Adams the second president of the United States. He poured out all of his grief at the plight of black America and the sinfulness of white America, which had blood on its hands for enslaving 700,000 fellow creatures and oppressing some 90,000 free blacks. Starting with it, with Quote, my mind has been deeply affected uh, at the awful judgments, as I believe, of, of an offended God now displayed conspicuously over this city through the grievous mortality suffered on its, on its inhabitants. Mifflin asked Adams what the president might do about, quote, the abominable trade carried on through Delaware and Maryland by Negro drovers by drove after drove of the poor afflicted blacks, like droves of cattle for market, carrying them into the southern states for speculation, regardless of the separation of nearest family connections and natural ties." Unquote. Perhaps the President, Mifflin continued, quote, may be entirely without the knowledge of this atrocious and abominable crime, the internal slave trade talking about. But surely Adams knew who didn't know about the ballooning domestic slave trade that was betraying the promise of the American Revolution. Could not the President of the United States, a man who had been in the vanguard of the Age of Enlightenment, the intellectual heartbeat in the era of democratic revolutions, a constitution writer, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, a minister to England and France in the aftermath of the American Revolution, could not such a man, quote, do thy duty and discharge thyself? Awaiting the leader of the nation who ignored this duty, Mifflin said to Adams, awaited the awful judgments of an offended God. And then further, he said to Adams, Thou hast no, I know, thou hast no constitutional power to do anything about this business, and that the general government has none, but was there no higher power which obliged Adams to speak out on the matter? How could a country withstand divine displeasure, as Mifflin called, when its leaders, quote, had declared to all the world that it was self-evident all men were created equal, that they were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And then, continuing in Adam's words, say nothing about withholding from so great a part of our fellow men the inalienable rights with which they are endowed by their creator. Unquote, these black Americans. If barren of constitutional power, 
Did not Adams have moral capital to draw upon? Quote, Would to God our president might be animated to call the consideration of our legislatures to this grievous oppression of our fellow man, the blacks in this land, unquote. In the final stab, Mifflin charged that Washington had fixed a stigma on his presidency, on his legacy, by giving sanction to the law that Congress had passed six months before to establish the Mississippi Territory. The last chance for the federal legislature to ban slavery east of the Mississippi River. Instead, with the president's signature, it allowed a slave code that denied the slightest rights to blacks, even owning a dog. Once more, the nation's leader had opened, in Mifflin's words, a wide field to this infamous slave traffic. This time to a new country back of Georgia, the rest of Georgia, now found Mississippi, and so on. And then, with the dreaded disease lurking in his body, Mifflin and his wife returned to Chestnut Grove in Kankana, Delaware. By October 10th, the yellow fever was coursing through his body. For the next six days, his family stood at his side. On October 16, 1798, Mifflin passed away. The next morning, four free African Americans bore his casket from a wagon to the mur murder kill meeting house burial ground. Grieving at his graveside was his widow and children, a widow who had survived him for 17 years. Forbidden to attend were the areas of enslaved men and women whose masters feared that attending the funeral would intensify their yearning for freedom. Free blacks, on the other hand, thronged the funeral to honor him and watch him lowered into the unmarked grave. Anne Mifflin, a year later, still grieving wrote out for her two young sons that they should remember their father's greatest mission was on behalf of black America. Her words, that which most engaged the uniform exercise of his mind for a number of years as the top stone of his religious concern. A laborious travail of spirit and free disposal of his time and substance in advancing the liberation of the poor oppressed black people. A trumpet was given him, she told his sons, on this subject, to spread the alarm within the borders of our society that we might more and more arise and shake ourselves from the dust of the earth in a departure from this iniquity. And when our camp was in good degree purged from this filthiness, his commission was enlarged to go forth among the people and powers of the earth to labor and dissuade, dissuade them from such an unrighteous practice. He patiently bore their contumely in the experience of that blessing devolving on those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. This laborious exercise on this subject towards the latter part of his time had evidently no wasting effect on his frame, which hastened the period of a life much devoted to the self-denying path and close religious engagements of a faithful disciple of the Lamb. So that it might truly be said, he wore out his talents but did not rust out for one of yours. Um, I think uh, it's time for Q and A. Um, there are so much that I would have to say, but I know the hour uh, is getting late, and dinner is still awaits you. <laughs>